Welcome to Motivation Monday. Today we are actually talking about Gretchen Rubin's The Four Tendencies. The four tendencies that affect how you interact with the world around you and how people make decisions. So let's get into it. I love Gretchen Rubin's book, The Four Tendencies, because it feeds into my inner psychology nerd. Uh, For about six years, I studied the psychology of how people interact, how they make decisions, how they communicate with one another. And I've seen a lot of tests. I've seen a lot of tendency and motivational and um, personality tests that you can take. And this one's actually really different in my personal opinion. Uh, It's very simple at its core and easy to understand. And there is actually going to be a link to a free test that you can take to find out what your tendencies are so that you can better interact with the world around you. But let's talk about the first of the four tendencies. So we have four different tendencies. We have the upholder, the questioner, the obliger, and the rebel. And today, um, I'm actually gonna tell you which one I test as versus which one I think I actually am because it does take into a little bit of consideration what your actual personality is. I think my test was wrong, but we'll find out. Okay. So the four tendencies, the first one is the upholder. This is a fairly small percentage of the population that really does anything that they are asked to do because that is how they are motivated. They want to get things off their to-do list. That is just how they see the world. It's black and white. If I've been asked to do something or if I've made up my mind to do something, I'm gonna get it done because it's internally motivated. And if you know the difference between external and internal motivation, internal means because it's my expectation I want to get it done. I'm going to make it a priority. So it's going to happen, right? And versus if you're externally motivated, you have other people coming in and telling you you need to do something. And that might be your priority over your internal motivation. Okay. So while an upholder does take in some external motivation and they do rely on other people to kind of give them things, they're because they basically transform that into internal motivation, it's going to be done every time. And they don't need hand-holding. They don't need advice. They're just going to knock it out and get it done and get it done on time. Like for loan officers, I talk about this quite a bit. It's the people you love because they send in all of their paperwork, their bank statements, and everything you need in about 30 minutes after your request comes in. And if there's something they don't have, they'll say, well, I'll send it over as soon as I receive it. And they're phenomenal clients because they're so easy to work with. For realtors, it's the people that signs the amendment and the paperwork as soon as it comes through. And it's usually the person you put as second on the contract because their spouse is not the same, most likely. Uh, So they are going to motivate the other person to sign that contract. These upholders are really easy to work with. They can be in a lot of management positions, but there is a downside to being an upholder. And it's usually how frustrated you get with people that are not upholders because they are internally motivated. They can't conceptualize why someone else wouldn't get the job done, why they need handholding, why they need a coach, why they need all these external things to get things done when it's just as easy as just doing it. These are the people who say, just, just get it done. Why? Why is this a problem? And you have to take into consideration if you are an upholder that the majority of the population is not an upholder and they won't just get it done. And you're going to have to provide some extra incentives, feedback, or coaching in order to get that completed. So if you have a client that just continually puts it off and it gets under your skin, Again, and you can't understand it, there's a good indication that you might be an upholder if you are usually the person getting everything done on your end, okay? Now, if you're dealing with an upholder on the other side of the deal, they're the customer and you're not, this is not your style, they may be frustrated with you because you're not doing exactly what you asked them to do. So you may have to over communicate if there's a reason why something isn't being done on their schedule. All right, so uh, the second tendency, I can't talk today, the second tendency is going to be the one that I believe is 
my core tendency, which is the questioning tendency, the questioner. This is a larger portion of the population, not the largest, but we are a group of individuals that has to know all the details. Uh, we just, we really have to see the big picture. We're going to ask question after question after question. And it's not because we're trying to undermine authority or question your abilities. It's just because it's a comfort to us to have answers to these questions. We don't feel like we can move forward until we understand. So we're going to continue to ask questions until we have that. So that's great if you're a realtor on the questioner side, because you're going to do a lot of discovery in the process. You're going to ask clients, why do you want to sell your home? An upholder said, all right, let's get this done. But you're actually digging in and finding out more. Well, we have this family member who's far away and we really want to move closer to them. So you're able in the process to understand the holistic side of things and attack issues beforehand, right? So there's a really big bonus to that. There's also a downside, or several. Because you're asking so many questions, it can elongate the process and kind of start to make people think that you're questioning their ability. So a lot of men don't like to be questions. Women are women are a little more okay with it. It just depends on the personality traits. Um, but if you're questioning someone, it may seem like you're undermining them and you may have to pull back your questions and be a little more selective with what you're asking so that it doesn't give that appearance right? So be careful if you are a questioner, there is a balance you have to maintain because not everyone else cares about all the little details. Me as a person who likes all the little details, I get it, but not everyone does. Okay. So yes, it's a huge strength and yes, you can really get to the core of what people are actually asking for. But if you're over asking with someone who is not a questioner or someone who is not an obliger or someone who doesn't, isn't who's going to feel frustrated or attacked by that, you have to be self-aware and pull back. Okay. All right. And now the third one is going to be the obliger tendency. We love you guys. You are like the largest portion of the population. And that's a really, really good thing because y'all will do whatever we ask you to do. And it's beautiful, but it's done for a different reason than the upholder. The upholder will do it for internal reasons, right? They're self-motivated. They've transformed these external um, requests into an internal motivation, and therefore they're going to get it done. But on the downside, as an, obli- as, a, as an obliger, you're going to do it because someone else asked you to. Maybe if you ever have wanted to go to the gym, you're going to have to partner up with someone else because you'll never do it for yourself. It's not an internal motivation. You've got to have somebody else, right? That's why I'm not good at going to the gym. I'm, I'm not that kind of internally motivated. But you have to have a partner. You have to have someone else. So Maybe you have a book club and you have somebody else that you're going with and you really love this book club, but if there's not someone else that you're picking up to take to book club, you're not going to go. So same thing with your business. If you're not having those those blitz calls with other people, if you're not showing someone else your progress and that the, the calls you're making, the things you're doing, you may really, really need a coach. You may really need a coach uh, because if it's not externally put on you, you're probably not going to do it. And there's a downside to that as well, because you can take on so much that at one point you have this rebellion that comes into play and you're just like, I'm done, I'm done. These are sometimes the people who jump out of real estate just because they feel so overwhelmed by the expectations put on them by others and they just hit a, they hit a wall and they're complete and they're done and they want out. And it's, it's, it's this tendency that they have. They'll say yes to everything until it is just too much. And then they escape. People escape marriages. People escape jobs. People escape businesses just because it's too much. So if you're working with a, an obliger and you're not an obliger, maybe you're an upholder and you think they're an upholder because they're doing everything you ask but they're not doing anything for themselves and you see that, that's an indicator that they're actually an obliger, not just an upholder. And they're not doing it for internal motivation or reasons. So you really have to be careful with how you deal with them because they can easily take on too much, right? And as an obliger, we have to determine if something is done for us or for someone else and start to say no. 
I know, I know that's really hard, but it's for your longevity. So sometimes you have to say no to clients. You have to say no to those 6 a.m. phone calls or those eight o'clock at night phone calls when those crazy people want to open to wake you up and, and have you send something over. There are no emergencies in real estate. So you've got to really slow down and realize I need time for me. Otherwise, I'm going to snap. Okay. All right, now let's talk to my rebels. This is actually the one that I test for and it can be mistested quite a bit. So if you really do think this is not you, then it's okay to think it through. Go grab the book, go read it and see which tendency is actually actually your core tendency. You may have some rebel tendencies like I do, um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. So it sounds like, oh no, I don't wanna be a rebel. I was never a rebel in high school. I was never a rebel in college. I was always the goody two shoes. So it didn't make sense at first why I tested for a rebel. But then I started digging in a little bit more and I do have questioners, my main tendency and rebel as my secondary. And here's why. Rebels, because they are not internally or externally motivated, really, um, or well, they are internally motivated, just like an upholder, but they will refuse to do something just because you told them to, right? So they are going to push back from the external motivation. So a lot of top salespeople actually hit this rebel category because they're so good at bucking the system. When I came in as a title rep, I really came in and did things very differently. I didn't want to deliver donuts and these little like goodie packages. I know people love them, but I wanted to do something different. So I came in and created my own style. I mean, how many title reps do you know that do videos of educational content? Like this is just different. And I love that. The things that I do, like um, a lot of people host happy hours. I have a comedy night. Um, we're talking about karaoke that's coming up. I like to do things that are out of the box. And that's why I tend to test for the rebel. The rebels aren't bad because you come up with new and creative ideas and things that are outside the box. But more importantly, you are champions of a project. So if you're really going to go after something, you're going to get it done and you're going to do it well. So I know that when I have a project that I have complete ownership of, it's going to happen. Nothing's going to get in my way. It's it's going to be executed to the nth degree and it's going to be awesome, right? But if someone else gives me a project and tells me to do this, I'm going to kind of naturally push back. I'm not a full on rebel, so I have to fight that tendency. And I've learned over the years to push that back and just do as I'm told because I'm supposed to. To, there's some value in the things that other people have for me to do. And I have to talk myself into creating internal motivation so that I will behave and not be a rebel. Now, thankfully, it's my secondary tendency, not my first. So it only happens occasionally. But uh, even every once in a while, I do have to fight that core tendency. So that is the negative side of the rebel is that even though something is good and something can help us, like a doctor who tells us to take our medication, we may not want to just because we're a rebel and we don't want to take our meds. But it's good for us. Our lower blood pressure is a good thing. But unless the doctor comes in and says, hey, uh, it's up to you. Here's some research. Uh, you may or may not want to take these, but everything I'm seeing shows that it's a good thing. So here's the research and you figure it out. You may not take it. If they come and say, you need to take this. Um, no, thank you. I ain't going to even pick up my prescription. That's just how we are. So you really have to learn to fight that tendency and become stronger because you got to figure out how to take that external motivation and turn it into internal motivation, just like an upholder. We're polar opposites in these tendencies. So if you are a rebel and you meet or work with an upholder, maybe they're your broker, maybe they're your coach, it's going to be a little bit of a clash. Uh, those are diametrically opposed and you really have to be aware of the other uh, parties in the situation. So that takes us back to working together as a team. Why is it important to know these tendencies, know their strengths and weaknesses and know how to identify them? Because me and my husband, we are very different. He's actually an obliger, which I would have paired him as a rebel, and I guarantee he has rebel tendencies, and I'm a questioner. So as an obliger, it's confusing for him why I have to ask so many questions. And like, I'll ask simple questions like, uh, do we have everything we need for our road trip? I have this, I have this, I have this, I have this, because I need to make sure the holistic part of it is done. So, and he's like, why are you asking so many questions? And it, and it's just my nature and my brain never shuts off. 
And he's like, why can't you just sit there without your phone? I can't. I physically cannot turn off my cell phone because I need something to counteract all the questions because my brain never shuts off. So we have learned how to interact with each other and understand our strengths and weaknesses. For the most part, we're still struggling on a few things. And that's part of the fun and part of the process. But if you've ever had a coworker or maybe a client that you just really seem to clash with, pull out some of these tendencies, analyze what they're doing, what they, how they act and why this might have an influence on it. And if you understand how they interact and what motivates them, you can actually work with them a little better and try to get them to, to and not manipulate them, but try to find a middle ground between your communication style and your tendency and their tendency and work off of their tendency rather than your own natural one. All right, Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies, you can find it on Audible. You can buy it on Amazon. It's a fantastic read. I do recommend it. I think it's about 15 bucks. And just go ahead and read it and put what your tendency is or what you think your tendency is in the comments below. I really want to know. Um, and then also take the test. So you can put what you think it is after you've read the book and then take the test and see what it actually is. It's a phenomenal process. But go out there, kick some butt this week. Remember, you're not the only person out there. You're not the only, you're not, not everyone else is motivated the same way you are. So take into consideration how they operate and not just how you think they should.